Now I want to introduce to you our uh, guest lecturer for tonight, Dr. Stephen Woodworth. You have your little program, so you know uh, that Dr. Woodworth is a professor of history at TCU, uh, an author. Uh, he has authored, co-authored, or edited 32 books. That's amazing to me. Um, and when we were talking about, you know, who to get to come, and I won't explain to you exactly all the details, but uh, Dr. Woodworth and I, I can tell that tonight we would say that was providence. You might call it coincidence, I'd call it providence that it worked out that we have him uh, here. As I was looking and we were trying to decide on who we would ask, uh, I came upon Dr. Woodworth and his work. Um, and I was looking at a list of the books uh, that he had written and I saw uh, Nothing But Victory, The Army of Tennessee, 1861-1865. And then I saw Jefferson Davis, his generals, the failure of Confederate command in the West. Well, I, that was enough. I knew right then, it, you don't have to be a scholar to know that he's going to know something and probably a lot about General Hood and General Granberry. So we have him here tonight. I have to tell you, I, had, I told Dr. Woodward tonight that I'm reading another one of his books that is probably one of the most interesting things I've read recently, and it's called The Religious World of Civil War Soldiers. I mean, it's just a fabulous book. If you wonder in your mind, hey, how did these guys face, you know, the possibility of death every day? Well, read what they say in their letters about what they thought about divine providence. Uh, read, and I'm reading this right now. I told him, you know, both the North and the South, they both thought God was on their side. It's interesting, you know, to read uh, their accounts of how, uh, how they determined that. At any rate, uh, it's a great book, great, really, really well-researched, uh, very, very interesting. So we're going to get to hear Dr. Woodworth tonight. Uh, and so if you would, come tell us, Hood Countyans, about General John Bell Hood. Well, thank you, Morris. Thank you, everyone. It's Great to be here in Granbury this evening with this very large and good-looking crowd in this magnificent facility on this beautiful late summer evening. Well, this is Hood County and uh, the town of Granbury, and both named after Civil War generals. Now let's see if I can not make that ring so much. And uh, so I'm here to tell you about those generals. And I know that some of you may be here because you live in Hood County and you've heard it was named after a general and you thought it was time you found out who that was. And I also know that some of you have probably read and studied a lot about the Civil War. You know, estimates on the total number of books written about the Civil War run from the neighborhood of 50 to 70,000. Nobody really knows exactly how many. But that makes it about one a day since the war ended. Now, I can hardly read a book a day. When I, was at, uh, when I was doing my graduate work down at Rice, I had a professor whose slogan was a book a day. That was his slogan for grad students. Not to write, just to read. But um, I can hardly read a book a day. And the war had a, a hundred year head start on me before I got started and I didn't learn to read right away. So <clears throat> there are many, many Civil War books that I haven't read and possibly some of the ones that you've read are ones that I haven't. But that's uh, one of the things that makes the Civil War great. There were, there's so much information about it. Uh, as I was researching uh, different ones of my books, I would go around to different uh, manuscript collections and archives, and they would have the papers of sometimes uh, 5,000 or more individual Civil War soldiers. And again, you, you, you never can read or know it all. You know, there's always more to learn and more to do about the Civil War. Well, my topic for this evening is John Bell Hood. Uh, John Bell Hood was born in Kentucky in 1831. And uh, right away, you'll notice that that makes him one of the younger Civil War generals. In fact, we'll find that he will be the youngest general to, uh, on either side to command an independent field army. Uh, Hood attended West Point somewhat uh, against his father's wishes, his father for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why, really wasn't sure that a military career was best for Hood, but he seemed to take to it fairly well. Not necessarily the academics at West Point, he was 44th out of 50-some students in his class. Now, that makes him sound worse than maybe it ought to. There were 96 
uh, students in his class when he started out. So he was in the top half of the ones that started uh, because a lot of them don't make it through. You know, nowadays that's not so common. We don't wash out students so much uh, from college if you start and you stay out of trouble and keep your nose clean and uh, I don't know what you'd have to do or tweet or whatever to... Uh, some of you heard about that? Yeah, that, that's, those decisions are made well above my pay grade. But, uh, and for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, you're not going to hear it from me. <laughs> anyway, there was a bit of a scandal last summer. Uh, but Hood did graduate from West Point and uh, went into the regular army. And he served in the regular army during the 1850s. Uh, and uh, he served with the 2nd U.S. Cavalry Regiment right out here on the Texas frontier, because this was the Texas frontier back then. Now, I wish I could tell you whether uh, that I knew whether or not he had served in Hood County. Some of you uh, Hood County historians probably know that. But I do know he served on the Texas frontier. Uh, but the part of his life, of course, that I get interested in is when he gets to the Civil War. He, he fought the Comanches, which is what cavalry does on the Texas frontier in those days. When, when the Civil War broke out, Hood uh, decided that he would be from Texas and not from Kentucky. Kentucky did not secede, but Hood's sympathies were with secession and with the Confederacy. So he threw in with his adopted state of, Kente uh, of Texas and uh, went into the Confederate Army. And he, after being commissioned, uh, he had been a lieutenant in the United States Army, and he was moved up to uh, captain in the Confederate Army. And then, of course, because there was a war on, promotion was very fast. And so he moved up rapidly. And uh, by uh, early 1862, Hood was uh, a colonel and commanding a brigade of troops composed of three regiments of Texans and one regiment from Arkansas. And this is what came to be known as Hood's Texas Brigade. And it was at the head of this brigade that Hood first gained success and fame as a, as a Confederate officer. Shortly after coming into command of the brigade, Hood was promoted to Brigadier General. And then that spring, uh, when the roads dried out, and in those days, uh, military campaigns mostly had to be in the summertime because most of the roads in the south were dirt. And a dirt road in the wintertime would just be too muddy for an army to move on. They would actually, their wagons and guns would sink into the hubs of their wheels and they couldn't move them. So uh, when the spring came that year in 1862, Hood, of course, being stationed in Virginia, uh, why military operations heated up, and Hood soon found himself in, in, the, in the thick of the action. Uh, at that time, in the spring of 62, Union forces in Virginia were attempting to advance on Richmond, the Confederate capital, from the east. Uh, that was seen as an easier way to get to Richmond. In some ways it was, in some ways not. But at any rate, Hood was with the Confederate army that was opposing them. Now, one of the advantages that Union forces had there on the east side of Richmond was that the fighting was taking place on what amounted to a peninsula between the broad estuaries of the York and James Rivers. And that gave Union forces the option, because the Union had the more powerful navy, that gave Union forces the option of landing troops potentially behind Confederate lines and, and trapping the Confederates. So that was a big advantage for them. They tried that on one occasion, and uh, Confederate uh, Commanding General Joseph E. Johnston uh, assigned Brigadier General Hood and his Texas Brigade to reconnoiter the uh, Union landing force there, the, the larger Union force that had landed at a place called Eltham's Landing. Uh, and in the military language of that time, he didn't say to uh, reconnoiter or to scout the Union position. He said, feel the Union position. Look at that. <laughs> Feel the Union position gently and then fall back. Well, Hood attacked and, yeah, well, you know, once things get going, it's hard to stop. And the Texans got excited and they drove the Yankees back to their boats. And the Yankees got back in their boats and they left. And, uh, oh, speaking of Yankees, I'll just throw this in as a side you may have noticed that uh, I'm not 
originally from around here. <laughs> Despite 22 years of living in Texas, well, they say that you get your accent when you're five years old and that's what you've got for life. And when I was five years old, I lived in a suburb of Chicago. Now, 31 years ago, my, 32 years ago, my brother and I both left Illinois and I went to Texas and he went to Minnesota and we're still there. And he has the nerve to tell me now that I've developed a Texas accent. <laughs> I don't believe it. And I don't think you do either. You should hear his Minnesota accent, though. But uh, at any rate, the Texans drove the Yankees back to their boats at Altham's Landing, and they pulled out and left. General Johnston was a little, well, you know, Hood had not strictly obeyed orders, and he called Hood in. Is that what you call uh, feeling the enemy gently and falling back? And Hood, well, sir, well, uh, yes, sir, I guess so, and, or something to that effect, words to that effect, not exactly those words. And Johnston said, well, what would you and your Texans have done if I told you to attack, to attack the enemy and drive them back to their boats? And he said, well, they would have driven the Yankees into the river, and then they would have tried to swim out and capture the gunboats. <laughs> so Hood was pretty aggressive. That was one of the easier uh, fights for Hood on the, on the peninsula there. The fighting on the peninsula campaign was desperate. It was very hard. It was ferocious. It was some of the first really hard fighting of the war. Along with battles like uh, the Battle of Shiloh out in Tennessee, the fighting in the peninsula introduced Americans to what it was going to mean to fight a war like the Civil War, where uh, the, the two sides of the country were arrayed against each other and Americans fought Americans. And perhaps the climactic battle, and certainly the climactic battle for Hood and for his Texas Brigade, was the Battle of Gaines Mill. Now, to set up the Battle of Gaines Mill, I have to tell you that about the, well, exactly the end of May, on the last day of May, 1862, several weeks after that fight at Eltham's Landing, uh, General Johnston launched an all-out attack. It didn't go very well. Uh, it just did not work out well. Hood's brigade was not heavily engaged that day, but when Johnston himself rode to the front to see what was going on, he was badly wounded. And he was carried from the field. And Jefferson Davis had to pick a new general to command the Confederate Army defending Richmond. And uh, he, he looked around. He had to pick someone who was nearby. He couldn't call someone from another part of the country. And so he turned to his military advisor, who had been stationed in Richmond with a desk. And that military advisor was Robert E. Lee. And that worked out OK. For Davis and for the Confederacy, they did okay with Lee. So Lee took over the army around Richmond, and to him fell the job of driving the, the Union Army away from Richmond. And so in the uh, last week of June of 1862, Lee launched that offensive. And the second day of the offensive turned out to be, the, uh, in a sense, the decisive day. The Union forces had been holding their ground pretty stubbornly, and the Confederates had been un unable to drive them back. It was difficult to coordinate a big army like that. No American officer had ever really done it yet. And we look at the maps, the military maps, and we say, well, it's simple. Any fool can see. They just need to march over here and go over there and do this and do that. And that, yeah, that's how it works. And of course, Lee could see that too, but as Lee told Jefferson Davis, the problem he had was he couldn't get his orders carried out. And that's a problem that generals have, is getting all the different parts of the army to move the way you want them to. Well, on that second day of the battle, as, as it got on toward evening, and the Confederates had attacked both days and really had been unable to budge the Union army from the position that it had chosen. What, it had moved a little bit overnight, but they really hadn't been able to drive it yet. And the task fell to Hood and the Texas Brigade to assault the Union line. And so Hood led the Texas Brigade in uh, this great charge there at Gaines Mill. And they were successful. Now, not to claim too much credit, I mean, we have to be fair, other Confederate troops had been assaulting the Union line all day, and, and it had been a hard fight. And they had maybe worn down the Yankees and, and at least absorbed a lot of their ammunition. Uh, and uh, and set things up for Hood, but it was Hood and the Texans who broke the Union line at Gaines Mill, and in many ways it was Hood's most glorious moment in the entire Civil War when he led his Texans through the Union line at Gaines Mill, and they broke that line there. Um, 
it was a bloody fight. Hood himself remained untouched, but every other field officer, that is, officer of the grade of major or above, major, lieutenant, colonel, colonel, or uh, in the in entire Texas brigade was killed or wounded uh, in that fight at Gaines Mill. Somehow Hood remained unhit, even though he was out in front of his troops leading them from the front. But as we're going to see, Hood's not always going to be that uh, lucky, providentially favored. It, it didn't work out that way for him in all the battles. Well, Hood continued to command the Texas Brigade through uh, the fighting in 1862. Lee successfully drove Mc the Union General McClellan and his army down that peninsula, back away from Richmond, and then uh, moved up into northern Virginia where the Union was building up another army. And uh, Hood took a, a very key role in the Second Battle of Manassas, or as it was called in the north, the Second Battle of Bull Run. And there, uh, Lee brilliantly set up uh, the Union Commander General John Pope uh, and helped by some bad performances by some of Pope's generals to give credit where it's due. But Lee brilliantly set up Pope in such a way that Pope was just very vulnerable for Lee to strike a blow. And when that blow fell, when Lee finally struck his, his heavy blow that would crush the flank of Polk's army, again, it happened to be, I don't know if it happened to be, but it just was Hood and the Texas Brigade that led that attack. And they, uh, they swept the enemy from the field, again, not without heavy fighting. The Yankees were not going to go away without a lot of very heavy fighting, and many of the Texans fell killed and wounded there at Second Bull Run, well, or Second Manassas, if you will. Well, that was uh, at the end of uh, August of 1862. And so then Lee was very encouraged, and he decided that he should carry the war to the enemy and to the enemy's country. And so Lee took his, what he was now calling the Army of Northern Virginia, of which Hood's brigade, he, Lee was increasingly coming to recognize and said so that Hood's brigade was one of his very best fighting brigades. Lee took his army across the Potomac River, out of Virginia and into Maryland, and uh, hoping to defeat the Union Army north of the Potomac, possibly threaten Washington. The, the possibilities were enormous. You could threaten Washington, threaten Baltimore. By the way, the, you could threaten Washington. The odds of actually taking it were pretty small. It was very, very heavily fortified and very heavily garrisoned, so not much of a chance of taking it, but you could take Baltimore. You could take Harrisburg. Who knows what kind of mischief you could do up there, and if you could just defeat a Union army up there, uh, who knows, maybe uh, Lincoln, or at least the northern populace, would be ready to throw in the towel. But things didn't quite work out for Lee the way he planned. A copy of his orders to his army got lost, and yes, McClellan and his men found them. They were found by Union soldiers and turned over to McClellan, who was back in command of the Union Army there instead of Pope. And uh, McClellan moved more aggressively than McClellan usually moved, which isn't saying much, but still not what Lee was figuring on. And he, he was able to catch Lee in a very dangerous position. Lee was near a small town in western Maryland called Sharpsburg. And that's what Confederates called the battle that happened next, the Battle of Sharpsburg. Uh, there was a creek in front of Lee's lines. Uh, not, it was several hundred yards in front in most places. And that creek was called Antietam Creek. And so the Union name for the battle was the Battle of Antietam. And the Confederate name of the battle was the Battle of Sharpsburg. Now what was especially desperate for Lee there was not what was in front of him. Well, that yeah, the Union Army, yes, was there. But what was behind him? Because what was behind him was the Potomac River. And it was crossable only at one place. Well, there was a ford called Bottler's Ford. But that, you, Lee would be able to move his troops across that ford only very slowly. It would take hours to get the Army of Northern Virginia across Bottler's Ford, and that's behind him. Now, if he fights a battle in that position, uh, and if he gets the worst of, it, worst of it, he will not be able to retreat. Not the way you have to retreat after you lose a battle, when you have to get out of there pretty quick. He won't be able to get out of there pretty quick, and that means he will lose his whole army. So Lee is gambling big time. He thinks he can beat McClellan even in that position. Uh, McClellan outnumbers Lee. As it turned out, McClellan didn't put all of his troops into the battle. Still, what happened next on, ready for the date? September 17th, 
1862. So 103 years ago this very day, uh, Constitution Day, if anyone is also uh, thinking about the date. On, but on September 17, 1862, uh, McClellan launched his attack against Lee. He started up on the north end of the line. He hit Stonewall Jackson's corps of Lee's army, and the fighting was tremendous. It was, it was fiercer than anything that had been seen before. Lee's army was fighting for its life. The Union Army was fighting for their home country. This was now in their, on their side of the Potomac. And uh, both sides now were experienced and veterans, and they weren't going to be scared off uh, by a little bit of fighting. So it was a ferocious battle. And in fact, September 17th still stands as the bloodiest day of combat in United States history, in all of American history. 4,800 Americans died that day. Now that's on both sides, uh, but 4,800 died. That's more than uh, Pearl Harbor was 2,700. Of course, September 11, 2001 was 3,000. Uh, I don't know if I'd call those combat deaths. That, that, was, um, that was sort of a mass assassination that happened on that day. Uh, but um, um, dishonorable to the perpetrators, of course, in, in that situation. But September 17th was a battle. And the people that were killed uh, on both sides had weapons in their hand and were doing their fighting their best. And uh, this was a tremendous battle. And after a couple of hours of fighting up there on that north end of the battlefield, Stonewall Jackson's Corps was fought to a frazzle. And uh, they were about giving way. And the Union forces were about going to drive through there in a position where they could roll up Lee's line. And there would be no retreat. There would be no escape. And Stonewall Jackson called on what was by this time Hood's division. Hood's division commander, that's the next unit up larger than a brigade. The brigade was four regiments. There were several brigades in the division. Hood's division commander had gotten sick and had to go on sick leave several uh, months, a couple of months before. And so Hood was really commanding a division here at, at Antietam or Sharpsburg. And uh, he was called on to plug the gap. Now Hood's men were not happy about this, being called on to this. They had been marching hard for a number of days uh, and they had been doing some fighting recently, and they had not had a chance to eat in a couple of days. And here this morning, they thought they would finally get to eat. So they had started their cook fires, and they were starting to cook some food over their fires. They were finally going to get some food. And, and before their food was ready to eat, the word came back, uh, the lines are giving way. You have to move up and, and plug the line. And so they were in a very bad mood, and maybe that's why they fought so hard. Uh, they, they did fight hard, and it was a tremendous fight. There was a cornfield that became famous in American history. It's, it's referred to as the cornfield. Actually, it belonged to a farmer named Miller. But still, if you talk to a Civil War historian, you talk about such and such happened in the cornfield, he'll know probably that you mean the Miller cornfield at Sharpsburg. And uh, the 1st Texas Regiment, part of Hood's Texas Brigade, there at the cornfield, had the grim and, and sad distinction of suffering the highest percentage regimental casualties of any regiment in any action in the Civil War. 82% of the 1st Texas became casualties there in the Miller Cornfield. Uh, the fighting was tremendous. Hood, Hood's division, and like all of the Army of, the Potom or the Army of Northern Virginia at that time, was very depleted. That summer, they had fought on the peninsula. They had fought at Second Bull Run. Casualties have been heavy at every one of these, loca at every one of these places in numerous battles. And Hood's division had only about 2,000 men when he went into the battle. And casualties in his division as a whole were almost 50% over, over the entire division. And, uh, but they stopped the Union breakthrough. And uh, when it was over, and this it sounds kind of strange, but Jackson. Uh, looked over the battlefield and saw how hard things had been fought and how close they had come to losing it completely, just on his end of the battlefield, several times. And he says, God has been very good to us today. And people kind of look at that and like, Jackson, how can you say that? This battlefield's covered with corpses and, and wounded men. But what Jackson meant was he felt like God had, had delivered them and somehow that they, they, they just, by all rights, they should have lost that battle and, and been overrun. But it didn't happen, and Hood and his men had played a part. After the battle, when Lee asked Hood, General Hood, where is your division? And he said, it's on the field of battle where you ordered it, sir. Uh, that 
almost half the division had, had been left behind. So a pretty grim day there at Antietam, but uh, that's how it is in war. When you win a lot of glory, uh, a lot of times it's over a lot of people suffering and dying, and that's just how it is. General Sherman had something to say about that too, didn't he? Well, uh, Hood still had remained unhurt through all this. It's kind of amazing being in the midst of that. Hood was a general who led from the front. He didn't take up some safe position in the rear. And so far, he just had seemed to live a charmed life. Well, Hood uh, was confirmed in his command of a division, uh, and, and uh, that became official. He was a division commander, and he got the appropriate promotion to major general, or what we would today call a two-star general. Actually, all Confederate generals wore a three-star insignia. But uh, he's now a major general and commanding a division. And he's with the Army of Northern Virginia at the Battle of Fredericksburg, but he didn't really see action at Fredericksburg. His, his part of the army just wasn't really threatened, and, and Fredericksburg was not that hard a battle for the Confederates overall, and he just didn't get into the fight there. And uh, likewise, at Chancellorsville, uh, Hood, Hood's division was detached and, and wasn't with the army there in the spring of 1863. But in June of 1863, Lee once again decided that he might be able to accomplish something by marching north. And so the Army of Northern Virginia marches north. And of course, Hood's division marches north. Now, four brigades in all, the Texas Brigade, a brigade from Alabama, and one from Georgia, and another, uh, no, make it two from Georgia, and one from Alabama. And so Hood's division marches north with the Army of Northern Virginia. And the lead elements of the Army of Northern Virginia collided with Union forces just outside a little Pennsylvania town that has become very famous. If you only know one Civil War battlefield, you probably know about Gettysburg. So they met there at Gettysburg. Now, Hood was part of the Confederate First Corps, which happened to be bringing up the rear on that march. Just it was their assignment, uh, what they were assigned to do and where they were in that particular part of the march. So they were some of the last troops. And so on July 1st, the, the first day of that Battle of Gettysburg, Hood's troops didn't see action. They were there for the second day of July when Lee assigned to General Longstreet, that's Hood's corps commander, that's, that's Hood and two other divisions, to uh, make a march uh, around to the south end of the battlefield and to attack the Union position there. And so in this case, Hood's division was the first one to go into action. Now, they were to hit the Union flank, and there was actually quite a lot of confusion about where the flank was. Again, for us, looking back at the nice, neat battlefield maps, it's so easy. We could say, there's the Union position exactly there, and all you have to do is just go over here, and it's the simplest thing in the world. And General Lee would have loved to have had one of those nice uh, uh, battlefield maps that we get to look, look at now in the history book, and, he also wouldn't mind reading what happened in the Battle of Gettysburg, because he said later, if we'd have known what would have happened on the last day of the battle, we wouldn't have done that again. And I bet, I know in my life, I've had a few things that I wouldn't have repeated again, and I've never even been in a war. A lot of things I wouldn't have tried again. We have those when we're young, and sometimes when we're not so young. But at any rate, it was not so easy to find the Union flank. It, Officers who were sent out to scout it came back and they gave Lee one report, which, which wasn't really true. And, and then on top of that, the general who was in command of the Union flank wouldn't hold still, which was frustrating, I'm sure, to General Lee and General Longstreet. It was also frustrating to the Union commander, I can tell you. His guys were not staying where he put them. Uh, so there was a lot of confusion, but there, uh, that's the way it is in battles. There is a lot of confusion. And it seems simple afterwards, and yes, if you knew, it would be simple. But they tried to hit the Union flank, and they had orders to hit it in a certain place. Now, famously, famously, General Hood comes back to General Longstreet uh, just as they're about to go into action. He says, General Longstreet, we can go around their flank. And some of you have seen the movie, so you know he said that. You seen the movie Gettysburg, some of you? Uh, there was a movie made of the Battle of Gettysburg, and it had good points and bad points, by the way. One of my gripes about... Um, uh, and some of us were talking about this actually before the, before the uh, lecture this evening. One of the problems of the way uh, many movies 
depict the Civil War is they depict everyone being far too old. Remember that at the Battle of Gettysburg, Hood was 32 years old. And 32 is not all that old. It's really young. And the, the more it recedes in the rearview mirror, the younger it looks to me. And, uh, and you look at General Hood in, uh, in the movie, if you've seen it, and he is substantially older than that. And that's in the movie Gettysburg, never mind gods and generals, when everybody was all 10 years older. Uh, if, and if you haven't seen those movies, uh, well, don't worry about it. But anyway, uh, it, it, they have their good points. Hood famously comes to Longstreet and says, we can go around the enemy's flank. And Longstreet says, no, we can't. And it just looks like one of those terribly frustrating things in war where people are just so stupid, you can't believe how stupid they were. And I have a, a professor friend who teaches up at a, uh, a university up in the north, and uh, he says, uh, he calls this the what fools they were school of historical interpretation. Uh, none of them were fools, actually. These are all guys who had graduated from West Point, and fools didn't graduate from West Point. Half the class only got through, and, and they, weren't, they weren't dummies that got there as a general rule, I think. So they were all intelligent men, and they all knew a lot, and they're, so if, they, if what they're doing looks stupid, there's probably something going on we don't understand. In fact, there were things going on. Uh, it wouldn't have been that simple. Hood was right. If you could get around the Union flank just now, and if they would hold still for you to do that, you could do some real, real damage over there. But Longstreet was also right that their orders really didn't call for that, that you have to act according to your orders in order to stay in harmony with the rest of the army. We can't have the units of the army running off uh, separate from each other and doing all their own thing. And it wouldn't have been as easy to get around that flank as it might look. The terrain was very difficult, uh, and the more so the farther out that way you got. And um, there was also a strong chance that the Union Army would not just sit there and wait to see what you were going to do to it. They might react. So it was, it's, it's, Hood had a point, and it was a good point. But Longstreet had a point, and it was a good point, too. Uh, so nobody was being completely stupid. It was a kind of a difference of opinion about what we should do, and they decided, let's go ahead and run the plan, and they did. And it almost worked. It was very close to working. And uh, you may know about the, the fighting that took place there, some of the most famous fighting in the war on the slopes of a hill called Little Round Top. And the Texas Brigade fought there on the slopes of Little Round Top. But Hood didn't. The attack was just getting started, and Hood was out in front of his men in an artillery shell exploded in the air not far from Hood, and a shell fragment struck him in the left arm. Now, unlike what often happened when someone would be wounded in the Civil War, Hood's arm did not have to be amputated. Uh, amputation was common in the Civil War, both because medicine was relatively primitive and because the wounds uh, that were inflicted by the type of rifle that they used at that time was, was very, were very destructive. The rifles fired a 58 caliber soft lead slug. So it was, it was pretty destructive when it hit, and it would really smash bones. And even, I think, modern surgeons would probably have their hands full to put those bones back together right. I don't, maybe they could. I have, I'm not a doctor, at least not the kind that helps people. I'm the kind that makes them sick. Um, <laughs> that's what I tell my students. <laughs> but I'm not going to give you any exams, you see, so <laughs> you're in business. Uh, and actually, I don't like giving exams anyway. I just like telling stories to people who like to hear about history. So uh, this, is, this is my favorite kind of history class. But, uh, and we'll see whether it's your favorite if you come back in October. Uh, Lutton's for punishment. Anyway, uh, I don't know if a modern, modern surgeon could put those, those bones those, uh, together after they got hit by, in some of those cases, they were shattered, just shattered the arm bones. Uh, but... Um, they sure couldn't back then. There was no way they could. And they, they were learning about infection, but they, there was a lot they didn't know about it. And, but they did know that in most cases, if a limb gets shattered uh, and we don't amputate it, uh, that person's going to die. And so they often would amputate. In this case, the wound was, was relative. I mean, as, as a, getting a chunk of hot metal in your arm uh, could be minor, it was relatively minor, and they didn't have to amputate his arm. They were able to save his arm. That was the good news. The bad news 
was that after this, his left arm was more or less unusable. Now, like about everything about John Bell Hood, the historians argue about it, about just how unusable his arm was, but more or less unusable, we can say, after this. So Hood's, uh, if you want to call it luck, his seemingly charmed life, if you want to call it that, uh, had run out, uh, and Hood was wounded, and so he didn't he didn't get to serve in the rest of the Battle of Gettysburg and, and didn't get to fight with his division throughout the remainder of that day. Well, uh, Hood recuperated for a couple of months after that. And then late that summer, in uh, early September, Hood's division, along with other Confederate troops of the Army of Northern Virginia, got orders for a transfer. They were going to be moved down to Georgia to join the Confederate Army of Tennessee under Braxton Bragg to try to turn back Union troops there that had penetrated all the way through Tennessee. And now we're advancing into Georgia itself, a deep south state. And so Hood's division would be one of the divisions that would be tasked with reinforcing Bragg. And Hood's uh, officers came to him and they encouraged him, we, we really would like, sir, we really feel more confident fighting under you. We'd love to have you leading us in this next battle. And so Hood agreed to come, even though his arm was still in a sling at that time. And Hood. Uh, and so Hood was present with his division when they went down to Georgia, and on uh, September 19th and 20th, 1863, uh, Hood's division took part in the Battle of Chickamauga, another uh, ferocious battle uh, that uh, also has the distinction of one, ha having one of the highest uh, percentage ca casualty rates of, of total forces involved in both sides. On the second day, of the, Hood's forces, by the way, were heavily engaged on both uh, days of the battle. And, uh, but on the second day, Hood had another one of those great experiences where his troops were able to punch through a hole in the Union line. The hole had actually been opened by a mistake of the Union high command, but Confederate troops had just happened to be there ready to take advantage of it. Other Confederate troops had pushed through the hole, and then it, was, it came the turn uh, according to orders, then it came the turn of Hood's division to advance through there, and by this time Hood is really has supervision of a couple of divisions, but he's always supervising the way he does supervise troops in the field, which is from the front. It's a way he knows to lead, to be up there where he can really see what's going on, where the Yankees are, what they're doing, what the situation is, and where his troops need to go and send them there. And he's doing it, and they are advancing uh, and, and pushing back uh, the Union uh, reserve forces that are trying to block their advance. And then Hood gets struck with a rifle bullet in the right leg. It struck him in the thigh, the right thigh, very high up on his thigh. And uh, again, it's one of these 58 caliber soft lead bullets. That is a big chunk of lead. And uh, this one, he didn't get off easy at all. The bullet uh, went in there and it shattered the big bone in his thigh. You could die from a wound like that, and people often did. Uh, providential, I guess you could say, that that bullet did not get the big artery in his thigh, or he would have been dead in, in a minute or so. But he, he didn't, but they carried him to the rear to a, a, a field hospital. And now there's only one thing that you could do for a wound like that. It has hit that big bone in the thigh, and it has shattered it. There's not going to be any putting it together, and they're going to have to amputate. So they amputated his right leg just below the hip. I mean, just way high on the right leg. And uh, that could have been dangerous, too. He very could have easily died of that, because if infection gets into the amputation wound, the only thing they can do is amputate a little higher. With Hood, there wasn't any higher to go. There wasn't going to be any more amputation. If in infection had set into the stump of, of his leg, he just would have died. But it didn't. Now, there were reports going, some of the early reports going back to Richmond said General Hood is dead or General Hood is mortally wounded and he's not going to make it. But he did. He survived and went back then to Richmond to recuperate. Now, you know, this is someone who's been shot up pretty good. I mean, he's lost the use of his left arm. He has entirely lost his right leg. Uh, which is a very major loss. We're talking the entire right leg, not just lower leg, but the whole thing. And uh, this is a real shock to the, the system. It's amazing that he was able to come through that. 
and these wounds so close in time, July 2nd for the first wound, September 20th for the second wound. But he did survive, and he came back. And that winter he recuperated in Richmond. And he would, his, the men of his division uh, took up a collection of money, and they bought him an artificial leg that he could wear. And he actually came to have several. Uh, it was a more of a peg leg. It's not a really sophisticated prosthetic like we have now, of course. And um, he could ride if he was strapped in the saddle. So he would ride on a horse and strapped in the saddle. And that winter, he got to be friends with Jefferson Davis. And he and Jefferson Davis would go for long rides around Richmond. Of course, that was a chance for Hood to make sure that Davis knew that he was back to strength. He could ride a horse. He was ready for action again. He could get back into the fight. It's one uh, Richmond uh, 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 woman, well, she was actually a South Carolinian, but she was living in Richmond, uh, told Hood, she said, uh, uh, if, if I were you, I would flinch at every bullet. Um, but uh, Hood wanted to get back into action. And the following spring, the spring of 1864, he got his wish. Uh, not with his old division. That division had been transferred back to Virginia and stayed there the rest of the war. But Hood was sent back down to Georgia to command a corps. Now, that's the next larger unit than a division. And so with it, Hood gets a promotion to what we would call a three-star general, a lieutenant general, so a higher rank, and he's now commanding a corps, one of three corps commanders in the Army of Tennessee. They're going to be fighting under Joseph Johnson, who's also recovered from his earlier wound, and their job will be to protect Atlanta. Well, throughout the spring and early summer of 1864, Johnston's army maneuvered and retreated and maneuvered and retreated. Now, between the generals and the army, including Hood, and between the historians afterward, there came to be a lot of finger pointing about whose fault it was that we retreated. And uh, I don't like those whose fault it was things. They, they did retreat. And uh, the older I get, the less I like the whose fault I was game, whose fault it was game. They retreated, and they got back down to the outskirts of, of, of Atlanta, just on the outskirts of Atlanta. And you can say that it was because of Sherman's skill, or you can say it was because of Johnston's lack of aggressiveness, or you can say, as some do, that it was because Johnston's subordinate generals hadn't fought when he wanted them to. Uh, not too many people say that, really, but... Uh, anyway, uh, or, or you can say it was all of the above, or maybe it was the size of the Union force, but there they were. And Jefferson Davis up in Richmond was dissatisfied with Johnston. He believed that Johnston was not doing his job. Johnston needed the fight to defend Atlanta. And Davis sent Johnston a series of messages seeking assurance that Johnston would not give up Atlanta without a fight. But Johnston would give no such assurance probably because Johnston would have given up Atlanta without a fight. Atlanta was probably within days of falling if Johnston's previous uh, performance was uh, any indication. And so Davis decided that Johnston had to go. Johnston hadn't been shot this time, but he needed to go, just as before Richmond, uh, back two years before. And so Davis now, again, needs a replacement. He needs somebody to command the army. Robert E. Lee is busy elsewhere. Davis needs somebody who's already in Georgia. And he wants somebody who will fight, somebody who is aggressive. He asks Lee, who had commanded Hood earlier in the war, what do you think of General Hood for commander of the Army of Tennessee? And uh, Lee was equivocal. He said, it's, it's dangerous to change the commander of an army in that kind of situation where they are. Uh, Hood is a hard fighter. He's very industrious on the battlefield, uh, not so much off the battlefield. So uh, suggesting that maybe Hood was not always, in Lee's eyes, as punctilious and careful about preparing his command, uh, but he was uh, very aggressive on the battlefield. So Lee was equivocal about whether that was a good idea or not. Of course, Lee's very tactful. Uh, maybe he was tr trying to be nice to Johnston. At any rate, Davis decided Hood was the man. He'll fight. And so on July 17, 1864, Davis gave the order and sent tell it by telegraph, sent the order down to Atlanta. Johnston is relieved of command, and Hood will take over command. Now, Hood wasn't so sure he wanted that job. The problem is you're expected to hold Atlanta, and 
Now, Sherman was very good at maneuver. Sherman was very good at what they called the turning maneuver. Uh, he, could, he could go around the edge. He, somehow he could always get around the edge of your line. And when he does that, you either have to retreat or fight. Now, General Lee, in situations like that, if he got turned, General Lee would always fight. And that's how Chancellorsville and other battles had happened. But General Johnston, he would always retreat when that happened and look for a more advantageous situation further to the rear. The trouble for Hood is he's not going to have any choice in the matter. He's expected to hold Atlanta, and he can't retreat again at all. Any retreat, and Atlanta falls. So Hood will have to fight as soon as Sherman turns him. And Sherman could do those turning maneuvers uh, almost better than not. maybe any other Civil War general. I, that's going some, but he was one of the better ones. And sure enough, three days after, uh, uh, after a Hood took command, Sherman, he, he, he received in, information that Sherman's army was making a turning maneuver, threatening from the front while swinging around his flank. Hood decided to attack. He hoped to catch one wing of the Union army, not the whole thing, but one wing of it, in the act of crossing Peachtree Creek, and he launched an assault. But again, the problem, coordination, getting the army to do what you want. And Hood is now up against an extra problem that other commanding generals like Lee didn't face. And that is, although Hood can ride when he's strapped in the saddle, it seems to be difficult for him. Because what we find is we don't find Hood riding around the battlefield, uh, making, seeing what's happening and making sure people are getting where they need to go. Uh, Hood is tending to stay in the rear now and not on the back of a horse. And I certainly can't blame him in his physical condition, but this is making it harder for him. And so units are not getting to where Hood wants them to be, and they're not doing what Hood wants them to do when he wants them to do it. He's having to depend on other officers to do that for him. And for whatever reason, that's not working out very well. And so instead of catching that wing of the Union Army while they were crossing the creek, he caught them after they crossed the creek. They were pretty much ready for it and the attack failed. Two days later, he again had to react as Sherman continued his turning movement, going around the east side of Hood's position. And Hood planned attack, an attack that he thought would be a much like Stonewall Jackson's attack at Chancellorsville. Those of you who are Civil War fans, and you may know what that's talking about. It was Jackson's greatest, uh, finest hour. And Hood hoped to do that. And he did hit the Union Army on the flank, and in the rear, and in the front. And, but it, the Union troops they were hitting were some of the most experienced and tough uh, troops that, that uh, the Union had. They were much more experienced and much less likely to panic than the troops that Jackson had been up against two years before. And they just held their ground, in some cases hopping from one side of their uh, defensive works to the other to shoot one way and, and then to hop over it and shoot back to the other way. Uh, and, and they just really put up a tougher fight than you could have or should have expected them to do. And so although Hood had made a good effort, in the end, the battle had been unsuccessful and thousands more Confederate troops had been lost. And six days after that, Sherman launched another turning maneuver, each one of which threatened to trap Hood in the city and cut off his lines of supply. Sherman responded again, or excuse me, Hood responded to Sherman's movement again, and again he had the problem that he wasn't there. He assigned other people, General, there was a general named Stephen D. Lee, and there was a general named Alexander P. Stewart, and uh, General Stewart, General Lee, I want you to go out there, I want you to do this and do this, and, and they don't seem to understand their orders. They're good officers, but they're inexperienced, and they don't seem to really understand what Hood wants, and their divisions, their, their corps don't go where they're really supposed to go, the way they're supposed to go, when they're supposed to go, and the upshot of it was they, they tried hard, but they wound up making a head-on frontal assault that didn't have any chance of success at all. Once again, the attack failed and thousands of Confederates died. Now, as a general making plans, Hood had, Hood had not done too badly at Atlanta, even though all three attempts had been failures. Uh, it's, it, it was, he had made a good effort. The plans weren't bad. The problem was getting things to click and getting the army to carry them out. And that might have been the fault of Hood not having a leg and not being able to ride around a lot. And also it has to be mentioned that the Army of Tennessee was not the Army of Northern Virginia. 
Now, Lee had, had gotten the or Army of Northern Virginia into being a pretty well-oiled machine most of the time. And it worked pretty well and ran pretty well. And the Army of Tennessee really never did. So if the Army of Tennessee didn't click too well for Hood, maybe it wasn't because he wasn't always there. A general can't be every place, even if he's got two legs and can ride a horse all day uh, without getting tired. The Army of Tennessee never just seemed to click too well. It always seemed to have coordination problems and never work well together. At any rate, uh, Hood was able, despite all that, he was able to hang on to Atlanta for about another four weeks, which is amazing. Sherman would try to stretch his lines, and Hood would stretch out and block him, but eventually Sherman just got a position that Hood couldn't match, uh, sort of got the leverage on Hood, and at the end of August, Hood had to pull out of Atlanta. He did save his army, and there's that to be said for it. Give him credit for that. A lot of people blame Sherman for not trapping Hood's army. Well, I, I guess you give score a point for Hood, at least he, if he lost Atlanta, he didn't lose his army. Now we come down to the final chapter of Hood's Confederate career, and it's, it's the chapter that is the worst. It, it didn't end on a good note, unfortunately, for General Hood. There had been great glory in the early days leading his brigade, and leading the division had been pretty good, and the middle part of the war had seen Hood see some success, but also get wounded a lot. And the Atlanta campaign, he at least had plans that you could say, this is a really good plan. It, it really ought to have worked. It almost did work. It didn't quite. And now we come to the part that doesn't look so good. This is late. This is somewhat analogous to the point in a football game where the team that's behind is going to throw a Hail Mary pass. And you know, those passes don't have a high, very high percentage of success. Uh, and bad things are likely to happen, but they're desperate. And the Confederacy was desperate. And so Hood came up with a desperate plan. Of course, the difference between football and war is that hopefully nobody gets killed in a football game and uh, literally killed, you know. But in war, people do. And th this kind of thing gets real costly. Desperate things are costly. And you have to start asking, asking. And, and I don't say that I answer because I don't really, I'm not sure what the answer should be. I know when you're in a war and you think it's important to fight that war and you think it's important to win that war, you tend to play off the string and, and fight it out as long as you can and try to win. And, and, and I don't mean to be a defeatist, but when do you say, maybe what's more important here is how many of these boys will go home to their families after the war and how many of these, these dads will, will be back home and kids will have dads to, to help raise them and all that. And that puts it all in a pretty grim light. Anyway. Who decided the thing to do was to move up into Tennessee. Not a bad idea. Uh, it, it, you can criticize it, and it has been criticized a lot. But of the options available to him, it was pretty good. It bothered General Grant a lot. The overall Union commander of all the Union armies did not like it. It really bugged him. He wanted Hood out of there. It, it really concerned him a lot. You have to think, if you've got the enemy, and an enemy who's not prone to get nervous in the service, uh, like U.S. Grant, pretty imperturbable fellow, and he's really annoyed that Hood's there, and he keeps sending messages to his general in Tennessee, when are you going to get Hood out of there? Uh, this is really a problem for us. We, we need him gone. Uh, again, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but uh, you have to figure that that wasn't too bad of a, a move. And, and the campaign started out fairly well. It was Hood this time who went around the Union force he was facing and was in a position to trap them. It was a place called Spring Hill, and it was one of the biggest Mita Bends of the war, maybe, or it's gone down. Because the thing with Mita Bends is we never know what did happen, and we can think it was anything, and we can think it could have been however big. But Hood was in a position. Hood got his army in a day of hard marching. Hood got his army into a position where, by all rights, they should have been able to trap one whole wing of the Union Army and trap it and catch it and destroy it and make it surrender. And it didn't happen. In fact, that whole wing of the Union Army reached, marched right by under Confederate noses right in front of them during the night and got away. It was incredible. The Union troops marching along the road that got them out of the trap could actually see the Confederate campfires just a few hundred yards back. In fact, some of the Union soldiers didn't think Confederate troops could be that close to their line of march. A couple of them went over to a campfire to light their cigars and got captured. It was the enemy. 
It was the Confederates. So they, that's how close they were. And they should have had them. And the next morning, could, Hood couldn't believe that they didn't. What had happened? Historians have talked about this for a long time. Was it Hood's fault? Was it some of his division commander's fault? And what can you say? Um, a lot of people have blamed it on Hood. A lot of people defend Hood vociferously. Uh, was it because Hood was tired after riding in the saddle all day? I have to mention here now, we've, we've discovered since, since the 90s, further research, uh, I think probably leading the charge on that was my friend Steve Davis of Atlanta, that there is no evidence to suggest that Hood was under the influence of any intoxicant whatsoever. Apparently he was stone cold sober for this event. But could it have been exhausting for a man with only one leg to ride in the saddle all day? It had to be, it just had to be. And Hood was, as Hood was going to bed, or had gone to bed, word was brought in to him about where the divisions were and where they needed to be. And people say, well, if he would have gotten up then and gotten people in position where they needed to be, they would have trapped the enemy at Spring Hill. Didn't happen. And maybe he was too tired. Again, some people vociferously deny that and become irate if you even suggest that Hood was, was the least bit tired. Maybe not. Uh, and, and the defenders of Hood will blame it on his division commanders. And again, the older I get, the less I like the blame game. Somehow it didn't happen. Things never seemed to work like that for the Army of Tennessee. Call it bad luck, providence, uh, God fought against them, their generals didn't cooperate, or all of the above, I don't know. But it didn't work, and the Union Army got away. The next day, November 30th, 1864, Hood pursued either... Furiously angry, as someone has said, wrathy as a rattlesnake, or quite calm and in a perfectly equable mood. You take your pick, and uh, someone, will be someone will be furious at you for asserting uh, either way. Uh, there's many advocates. At any rate, they went up the road. And uh, I don't profess to say which it is. I just, those are the choices you have. Furious or calm, they went up the road in pursuit of the Yankees, and they found that Yankee force uh, dug in, in entrenchments around the town of Franklin, Tennessee. The Union fr flanks were anchored on the Harpeth River, both, both sides, left and right. You could not turn their flanks. And their line was, was heavily entrenched, and not with entrenchments they'd made that day. The war had gone back and forth against Tennessee, and, and months and months ago, the Union forces had decided it would be good to have heavy fortifications around Franklin, and so they had built them there. And the Union force was in place and ready to defend itself. Some of the Union regiments were equipped by this time with seven-shot or even 17-shot repeating lever-action rifles rather than the muzzle loaders that everybody else had carried throughout the Civil War. The Confederates, in other words, are going to be bucking a lot of firepower. It was afternoon. It was November. Nightfall would be coming on in a couple of hours. Hood gave the order for his army to form up. Only two of his three corps were on hand, but those two corps were to make a massed frontal assault across two miles of open ground. It's been called the Pickett's Charge of the West. In fact, it was bigger than Pickett's Charge. Twice as many men over twice as long a distance of open ground. The distance didn't matter as much because it was out of range of enemy fire, but the enemy certainly could see them coming. And so the Battle of Franklin played out, and that is where the Army of Tennessee really lost its heart, so to speak. Uh, a half a dozen Confederate generals were killed in the battle, uh, including Hiram Granbury, uh, after whom this town is named. Uh, he was killed there. Uh, General Patrick uh, Claiborne, after whom Cleburne County, County, Texas is named. I guess it's Cleburne County, but it's named after General Patrick Claiborne. It's spelled the same, that's how he pronounced his name. Claiborne, probably the best division commander in the Confederate armies uh, died in that battle, and several other Confederate generals died. Thousands of Confederate troops died, and it was a very one-sided battle, and it was a slaughter. And Hood is probably condemned more for the Battle of Franklin than for anything else that happened in his career. Now, in his defense, I'll say that every really great general of the Civil War, Grant, Lee, or any others that can have a claim to real greatness, had one or two battles in their time that were really bad frontal attacks and got a lot of people slaughtered. 
if a general was aggressive was as aggressive as he needed to be in order to win big successes there was going to be a time when he kind of gambled one time too many when he uh, we wound up bucking a stack deck so to speak and and uh, Maybe this was Hood's time. And you can say, well, he was a great general. He was just being aggressive. If it would have worked, he would have been a hero, but it didn't work. On the other hand, people criticize Hood and say, but this was so bad. It was so, uh, just the situation of, for this attack was so bad that, that the odds of success were so poor uh, that he shouldn't have done it. And uh, the losses were so great. Some defenders of Hood say, well, what should he save the lives of his army for? They're about to lose the war anyway. Well, uh, again, if I were a soldier, I might would like to have my life after the war was over, even if I lost uh, to the Battle of Franklin. Well, the final, final act is anticlimax. Uh, the Union force at Franklin was only wanting to get away to Nashville farther north and uh, having blunted Hood's attack at Franklin, they withdrew and they pulled back to Nashville. Hood followed and, and camped outside Nashville. What was there to do? There was nothing. And like Mr. Micawber, Hood sat down and waited for something to turn up. How is he to win? You know, what, what can he do now? It's a desperate point in the war. You need a tremendous victory. And how are you possibly going to win it? And Hood figured they couldn't do it by by retreating, so he took up a position outside Nashville and he waited for the Union Army to come out and he hoped that when it did, somehow he and his men would be able to win a victory. But they couldn't. And on December 16th, when the Union Army uh, came out of Nashville, uh, it uh, pretty well crushed Hood's army and drove it back in retreat and Hood was relieved of command. Well, that was Hood's last significant command during the war. Uh, he, well, he wasn't relieved, actually. He asked to be relieved and then was relieved of command. It was clear that, that uh, there wasn't much future for him commanding this army anymore. It had been pretty badly crushed and was pretty discouraged. And so uh, as of December of 64, Hood's Civil War career was over. After the war, Hood um, retired to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and he married a New Orleans belle, uh, and he became a cotton broker and an insurance executive. And he had, was it 11 kids in 10 years or 10 kids in 11 years? <laughs> See, he didn't, he didn't have a medium-sized family like my wife and I. We only have seven. <laughs> and we still have people asking us if they're all ours. Well, there's only seven of them. Come on. He had 11. Now, he did have two sets of twins, so that helped. His poor wife. But anyway, uh, they had all these 11 kids. And then... When things were going great, once again, it seemed like sometimes th just Hood's, Hood's career would take a sad final turn. Maybe some of you know the turn. Uh, New Orleans in 1879 was hit by an epidemic of yellow fever, and it took the life of Hood and his wife and their oldest child, and the others were left orphaned. And so, in the end, it was a very, very sad story for John Bell Hood, the gallant Hood of Texas. But he certainly had left a memory as definitely one of the Confederacy's greatest brigade and division commanders, as a, a fighting commander par excellence, and as uh, someone who, who never gave up while he thought there was any chance of success. Thank you for your attention. I have time to answer a few questions if you have any and have patience to hear my answers. Over here. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I, I think he does. Uh, I think some shirt tail descendant of his uh, recently wrote a book about him. Uh, or anyway, but I, I don't actually know how many heirs he has. I'm not familiar with the modern Hood family. Any other questions? Over here? Yes. Uh, yes and no. Actually, both are true. Uh, everybody burned a piece of Atlanta. Um, 
As often happens when one of these cities burn, you very rarely have a city that just flat burns to the ground and it's all burnt and you can't burn it anymore because they burned it all down. It, even after two burnings, there was more of Atlanta left. Uh, Hood, yes, Hood, uh, on evacuating Atlanta at the end of August, beginning of September of 64, he did burn his ammunition and uh, depots and things that in Atlanta that he felt could be of use to the Union forces, which is kind of what you're supposed to do, but uh, I suppose people could argue with the judgment of that. At any rate, numerous railroad cars of ammunition went up, and it did start fires which uh, burned much uh, a good swath of Atlanta. And that's, those are actually the fires that are depicted in that scene in Gone with the Wind, uh, where they're riding around in that wagon. That was that. Was that. When Sherman marched out of Atlanta in uh, mid-November of 64, he burned additional uh, uh, resources and, and uh, strategic uh, things in Atlanta. Neither of the burnings was intended to burn down uh, residential areas, but some residential areas did catch fire in both cases. Both, both burnings were intended to destroy things that could be of use to the enemy, railroad depots, factories, warehouses, uh, uh, depots for ammunition. So both are right. Any other questions? Now that's a good question. You'd have to get a Hood County historian. Now there's, you know, there's some local experts on that here. Uh, I know that, you know, there were regiments or companies in Hood's brigade that came from all over East Texas. So that's as close as I can come, but there are others who could tell you better. Oh, the morphine story. Okay. <laughs> the suggestion was that, yes, yes, that's, yes, that Hood, uh, was Hood using morphine or opium or laudanum, which is a mixture of opium and alcohol? Uh, and the answer is not as far as we know. Now, that story has had some legs over the years. Um, apparently, there was a historian of Richard Ewell, another Confederate general who lost a leg and came back and, and wasn't as effective after he made his comeback. And uh, that historian of Ewell suggested that because of the pain, Hood might have used laudanum and might have become addicted to laudanum. And um, so that got repeated and passed down. Now, some people make much of the fact, aha, it's historians repeating each other. Yeah, historians do repeat each other. That's, you, you try to correct things, but you can't correct everything in an account. And if you, you said, well, I'm going to forget everything that's ever been done in the Civil War, and I'm going to do the Civil War from the ground up, well, then you wouldn't get very far. <laughs> so they do repeat each other. And, and I know some people get very outraged. Aha, aha, historians repeated this mistake. Happens all the time. And that's why we keep you know, researching and trying to correct that stuff. Well, somebody did. Um, the Hood and Laudanum story was repeated by uh, uh, Richard McMurray. He's a good historian and uh, an account of a friend. Uh, and he, in his 1983 uh, biography of Hood, he repeated the Laudanum story. And then in 1990, using uh, McMurray's uh, Hood biography, then I incorporated the Laudanum, Laudanum story into Jefferson Davis and his generals. Uh, which is my first book. And um, then in the early 1990s, just a couple years after that, talking to uh, Steve Davis, who is since is working on a big Hood biography and has since written uh, Atlanta Will Fall, a story of the Atlanta campaign. And Davis is a big Hood fan. I mean, he's a big Hood fan. I was considered a Hood fan when I wrote Jeff Davis and his generals. But I mean, Steve Davis really, really likes Hood. And but he was successful. He proved it to my satisfaction uh, that uh, there really, we can't find any primary evidence, any real evidence to show that Hood was on laudanum or anything else like that. And in fact, he convinced Rich McMurray too. And so McMurray has since retracted his, uh, his statements on laudanum. So we've all stopped. And in fact, uh, 
pretty much people had stopped saying, scholars and historians had stopped saying that Hood had used laudanum by, by the year 2000. So it's been uh, probably 20 years since anyone has, has written in a book that Hood used laudanum. Now recently there was a book come out that uh, really got very excited about those terrible historians who repeat each other's mistakes and say that Hood used laudanum. Well, we, we corrected the mistakes. That's what we do. That's, we, we try to correct things, and we got that corrected, and I'm glad that uh, someone has caught up with us now and, and agrees that Hood didn't use any laudanum. But no, he, he used some morphium under very strictly a strict medical control. The doctor logged every dose of morphium that Hood took, and Hood would always go for the minimum that he could take just during his recovery, immediately after the amputation of his leg, and for a couple months after, until he could sleep through the night without the morphium. So pretty much just the way that a careful doctor would do it today with your pain meds and try to avoid getting you, uh, getting you hooked on your pain meds. So the answer, no, he wasn't on drugs. Anything else? Here. Buck Preston, yeah. Now, when I say that Hood, Hood was in love with someone named Buck Preston, that sounds kind of bad. Um, <laughs> to me it does. Still. It was Sally Buchanan Preston, uh, and uh, because Buck was a nickname for Buchanan, and for whatever reason, they, she went, instead of going by Sally Preston, now I would think, you know, that she would want to go by Sally, but no, it was Buck Preston. But she was a real belle. She was very much sought after. And uh, Hood uh, seems to have fallen very much in love with her, was very smitten, and pursued her uh, relentlessly. Hood did everything relentlessly. Uh, and he pursued uh, uh, Buck Preston relentlessly through that uh, winter that he was recuperating there in Richmond. And... Uh, I incorporated that into Jeff Davis and his generals, and uh, if I were writing that book again now, and that's, it came out 25 years ago, no, yes, 25 years ago, and uh, uh, actually was written uh, really 28 years ago, and the manuscript was more or less complete at that time, so I've aged a good deal since then, and uh, if I were doing it again, I probably would have given less, less play to that. But I thought it was a good story at the time, and I was having some fun with it. So I would have left out the laudanum if I knew then what I know now, and I would have not totally left out Sally Buchanan Preston. Uh, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot more hesitant now to try to say what motivated anybody to do anything. And you'll find in my early writing, I'm, I'm more ready to tell you what I thought motivated somebody. And now I just I don't know why he did it. <laughs> Maybe they just seemed like the thing to do. Uh, but... Um, yeah, he, uh, he hoped to get in, engaged to Buck Preston, and he briefly thought he was, but she kind of turned him down and dumped him. And so he was, he was uh, unsuccessful in love there in, in Richmond that winter. But whether that influenced him to do anything, I wouldn't venture to say. Okay, have I covered everything? Anything else can I see out there? One more thing? <laughs>